One for the history books. The markets get the message about tightening, finally. Ukraine stalls the mighty Russian military, and a black woman takes a big step toward a seat on the bench of the highest court in the land. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, special contributor Larry Summers on being caught between the rock of inflation and the hard place of recession. I share very much the chairman's hope that a soft landing is possible, but I don't think it's something we can count on. And Candace Browning of Bank of America on corporate America coming to terms with zero emissions even in a time of war. This really is a movement. I mean, I was surprised. We saw history being made this week when Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson took a giant step toward the Supreme Court. U.S. Supreme Court nominee Ketanji Brown Jackson is set for questioning by a Senate committee. She's told the panel she's an independent thinker who decides cases from a neutral posture. Now, there may be some who claim, without a shred of evidence, that she'll be a rubber stamp for this president. I have four words. Look at the record. I interpret and apply the law to the facts of the case before me without fear or favor, consistent with my judicial oath. President Biden traveled to Europe in support of the coalition arrayed against Russia. President Biden feeling uh, questions from the media. They're talking about staying united with Western leaders. Do you think uh, that Russia needs to be removed from the G20? On the latter point, my answer is yes. If that can't be done, then we should ask to have both Ukraine uh, be able to attend the meetings. As Russian forces stalled in Ukraine. Ukrainian forces have essentially stalled the Russian advance, and Moscow's words on diplomacy are not really being matched by actions on the ground. Ceasefire is not a way out. The way out is immediate uh, withdrawal of all the Russian troops from Ukrainian territory. There is no other way out. Fed Chair Jay Powell finally got his message through to the markets. What would prevent you from doing a 50 basis point move in May? What would prevent us? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> um. <laughs> the story's changed in a big way in the first quarter, Tom. This is not the year people were looking for just three months ago. If someone had told all of us, everyone that watches the market, that the Fed would be aggressively hawkish, I think we'd all be surprised. And if you had any doubt at all that the bond markets got that message, just take a look at the 10-year this week, having its worst week since 2016, winding up on Friday just a tad under 2.5 percent. Not to be outdone, the two-year was down more in a week than it had been since 2008. And adding to the risk on sentiment were the equities markets, where the S&P 500 and NASDAQ were both up just under 2 percent, while that faithful safe haven currency, the Japanese yen, had its worst week in over two years. Welcome now our experts, Chris Aylman, CIO of the California State Teachers Retirement System and the CIO of Nuveen, Sarah Malik. So, Sarah, first of all, uh, congratulations on becoming CIO. I think it's the first time since you've been back on Wall Street Week. That's great to see. Let's talk Thanks, about David. this relatively risk on week we saw this week. Uh, what do you make of it, given the fact that we are at war? Well, the Fed's trying to create a Goldilocks scenario by engineering a soft landing. The equity markets are buying it and the bond markets aren't. We're watching three key things to monitor whether we're going to get to that, and that is the Fed movements, inflation, and geopolitical issues. Uh, the equity markets like what the Fed said in terms of becoming more hawkish because they're catching up to what's going on with inflation, getting more credibility around that battle. The equity markets like it because it means we won't have runaway inflation. Now, when it comes to inflation, the key question is, can economic growth be strong enough to overcome inflation? We think it can. Geopolitical risks are here to stay. With Russia, though, we see overall impact on global growth as moderate, but areas that we're monitoring are financial channels, commodities, and the impact on the European Union. All of that together still leaves us moderately bullish for the year. So, Chris, Sarah says the effect on the markets will be relatively moderate. Uh, from the war. The war is not going the way we thought it would. We thought it would over quickly one way or the other. It isn't. Are you more concerned about long-term consequences? Yeah, exactly, David. Sarah, I would have to say, I think the markets actually have their heads stuck in the sand. The bond market, they're awake and they're paying attention. I mean, David, as you said, twos are back to, to 228. 
Uh, there's a 30 basis point spread between twos and 30s. That tells me the 30-year bond knows it's going to be a flight to quality because it's a safe haven in a war, which is the word you started with this. Equity markets shouldn't be rising. They go up at the beginning of inflation. And Sarah, I give you that. But I think long term, the bond market's got this right and the stock market's got this wrong. It should be more cautionary and it should be more worried about inflation long term. Well, it's interesting, Chris, because if you look at the yield curve, actually, it's the front end of the yield curve. If you look at history, that is a strong indicator of recession. It's at some of the steepest levels that we've seen in almost a decade. So while I agree with your points, I think one thing is important is a yield curve can tell you a recession's coming, but the timing is crucial. A lot of money can be left on the table during the early cycles of rate hikes and initial yield curve inversions. Markets tend to be quite strong. And what my concern would be, you might leave a lot of money on the table if you become too concerned at this point about a future recession. So, Chris, as you manage that really substantial portfolio out there at Calisters, what do you look at in the yield curve, if anything at all? We heard from Jay Powell this week, and he said, look, at, sure, we pay attention to everything, but it's really the very, very early part of the yield curve, which we focus on, not, for example, the twos, tens. Jay can't control the twos, tens. He can talk it up and he can jawbone it. Uh, you guys have a wonderful montage of a whole bunch of Fed governors who all talk about the next meeting that not only is 50 basis points not off the table, I think one of them at the end says could be zero, it could be 25, could be 50, could be a point. I just think we have to recognize we're in a rising rate environment. Sarah's right. At the beginning, bond, uh, stocks do quite well at the beginning of inflation period. But this is not going to go away. This isn't, remember, transitory. It's not transitory. Inflation is going to be around. And this war impact is going to be felt, not just in the wheat market, but due to the lack of fertilizer. I really think, and you know, I know Larry Summers will talk to you later, that we're going to run into risk of a global famine, at least certainly in Europe, when it comes into the summer and fall. So, Sarah, you know, I like stocks in the, in the middle market, but I'm worried long term that we need to be more balanced in all of our portfolios. And Sarah, what about the inflation picture? Uh, because I have heard talk, talk of the fact that the deflationary pressures are basically gone between the supply chain and some of what we're seeing, the excess capacity is used up and we're going to have inflation for a good long time to come. I mean, if you look at the estimates for inflation and the break-evens, we're seeing about you know four percent inflation over the next couple of years, and then even two plus percent over the next decade. So you're right in that higher inflation is here to stay. The question is, what does that lead to? We're not in the stagflation camp. The recipe really isn't in place for that because we have strong economic growth and strong employment to go along with that inflation. So the key is, can the Fed raise rates enough to keep inflation? with a lid on it while also letting economic growth continue. We think that is a likely scenario that can happen. Uh, initially, the Fed will, rate, will raise interest rates pretty aggressively. Markets are um, expecting about 40 basis points of hikes in the next two meetings. So that's kind of hedging their bets between 25 and 50. We're in the multiple 25 basis point rate hikes for the next number of meetings. But then the Fed can wait and see. And if inflation does start to level off, they can also back off a little bit. And that would be that soft landing that they're trying to achieve. You know, Sarah, I've got to ask you, because I'm baffled about this, so I want your opinion. The, the unemployment numbers uh, this week were staggeringly low, the number of new jobless claims. Um, you know, we're having a hard time finding people. Uh, yet I know there are tons of people out of work. I mean, what do you guys make of this job market? Is it super strong or are we going to see a backlash of, of higher wages, which compounds the inflation problem? I mean, to agree with you, the job market has been, you know, the issue has been on the supply side. How do you get people back into the workforce and what does it take? It's been an issue going on for months and question because wage inflation is a big component of overall inflation. How much wage inflation will there be necessary to bring people back in? We expect the job market to loosen up a bit going forward this year now that we're past the most recent COVID variant. But when we're, when we're looking at our portfolios, the one key is and why we do like equities from here is focus on those companies that have pricing power. So if you have the pricing power to overcome inflation, expand your margins, beat earnings, and also economic resilience. We like U.S. large cap growth stocks for that reason. I think you can succeed in this kind of environment where growth does slow, but not to recessionary levels. I'm going to give you a hint, just some feedback because we talked to a lot of teachers in California uh, and companies actually are not going to have a lot of pricing power. I mean, they are squeezed. As, as you know, in California, gas prices are, are north of six bucks a gallon. And now that everybody is supposed to start driving back to work in, in the month of April, 
they're going to feel that squeeze in their pocketbook. So lucky companies that might have some pricing power. But uh, I think as we've seen, they're reducing the size of their servings and their products. And I think people are going to get squeezed. I think this inflation is going to catch them off guard. And I think, David, as long as we see this war continuing, you're going to have inflation pressures built into this economy, which the Fed is going to have a hard time beating because it's price inflation and potentially wage inflation. Chris, I want to take advantage of you here because you're such a major player in the institutional market here. We saw last year in the proxy uh, combat certain issues come up, things like how we treat workers and diversity and climate. Are those going to be the issues this year or is it going to be a new world given what we're seeing with inflation, given what we're seeing going on with the war? It's going to be those issues and even turned up on high. It's going to be, if you think of it, while people take those politically to us, they're risks to a company, long-term risk. If their workforce isn't diverse, they're going to suffer from the lack of, of, of different people thinking in different ways. If they're not thinking about climate change, they're behind the curve and they're going to have to pay a price. So for us, those are long-term risks. And I think supply chain is going to be a big question to people about their risk. People care more about human rights. Now that they realize how important Russia was to, to places like Germany, what about human rights in China? And you're going to see more and more companies need to address those and report to shareholders and give us information. But there's no question that diversity, inclusion, and then uh, the race to net zero are absolute priorities this year and next year and the year after. Sarah Malik, I'm oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah, oh, please. Thanks. But I was going to say, I agree with Chris. Globalization, climate change, and diversity and inclusion, three key issues going forward in, in a world that is constantly changing. Great. we got agreement on that one. So Sarah Malik of Nuveen and Chris Aylman of Kelsey's will be staying with us as we turn from the economy and the Fed to what a portfolio manager is to do about them. That's coming up next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Still with us are Chris Aylman of Calsters and Sarah Malik of Nuveen. So we've talked about the economy. We've talked about the Fed. We've talked about inflation. Let's talk about what that means for a portfolio manager. Chris, let's start with you, because I think of you particularly when we talk about inflation, because you've got a lot of pensions. Are you making enough money right now? Stocks are down this year. Bonds are down this year. Are you making enough money to pay those pensions? Well, when you look on it on an average, not on a one year period, David, no, the market's behind us. So we're having a tough time. But we do invest in longer term assets. Real estate has held its value. Uh, private equity has done really well, mostly because of the technology and the medical booms that we've seen this year. But then we also invest in inflation sensitive assets. We've got uh, timberland. We've got agriculture. We've got commodities, which have been up over 29 percent so far this year. So the key is diversification. We don't put all our money in one basket. We don't put it all in domestic stocks. We spread it across in a number of different asset classes. That way that we can weather years like this and then also make money in the positive years. So, Sarah, how do you manage it in this environment? Certainly there's a lot of volatility out there, a lot of uncertainty. I've read a number of analysts who say, you know, you got to get conservative right now. you got to go large cap. You want to start with some small cap. You want to go uh, value rather than growth. No, we also go public to privates at Nuveen. So in an inflationary environment, we like equities, we like commodities, and also real assets. And within equities, you know, we're being selective, but you know, companies with pricing power, we are seeing that from energy, which has a very tight cycle, and producer discipline, which is very important. They're, the producers are not just pulling, uh, just focusing on volume growth, they're returning cash to shareholders. And then we like large caps, large cap growth stocks, really beaten down this year, economically resilient. These are companies like, you know, a bellwether stock like my Microsoft, which has you know, such strong growth characteristics going forward, exposure to what we view as the next digital revolution, which is the metaverse. Um, and then also within fixed income, it is challenging, but there's areas that you can look at where you can find quality or also um, higher yields, like emerging market debt, floating rate loans. And we're definitely erring on the shorter duration side with fixed income, given what's going on with interest rates. Sarah, with a big growth stock like Microsoft, are you not worried about it's fully valued? 
You know, the growth stocks are actually pretty beaten down this year considering their structural growth rates. We found them to be quite interesting. Another name that we like in technology is applied materials. We're fans of the semiconductor cycle. Semis are getting larger and more complex. They require more equipment. Applied materials is in the sweet spot of TSMC and Intel, two of the biggest foundries. A lot of demand for their products. Um, we think that's a very well positioned company going forward. Chris, tell us about bonds in this environment. With rates going up, why does it make sense to be in bonds at all? No, good challenge. But I think just like Sarah said, we're looking at the short end. We're looking at private credit, which is variable rates. So we have opportunities to invest there. There's still a few credit opportunities, uh, but it's a challenging. We have the lowest weighting in fixed income that we've had uh, in the history of CalSTRS. Uh, so it's a challenging environment. And if you're in a 401k investor, it's really hard because all you really have is stocks and bonds. You don't have a lot of chances. Maybe if you have a real asset uh, option in your 401k, take advantage of that, but you've got to open your account, take a look at it and diversify across. As I said at the, at the earlier segment, David, I think that you know the Fed's making it clear they're raising rates. Sarah said it herself seven more times already this year and maybe more. So that, that 225, 230 uh, uh, two year is going to go higher and that's going to work against you. I mean, so far you have a, a negative 11% return in bonds this year. That's a tough way to go. So you got to diversify away into other types of assets. Sarah, as you manage your portfolio, we just heard from Chris that seven times, actually City came out on Friday of this week and said eight times. Uh, can the economy withstand that? And I guess the reason I ask that as a portfolio manager, do you have to be hedging against the possibility of recession actually? Well, if you look at the last couple of cycles, the Fed, the equity markets peaked at around nine to 14 rate hikes. So I think, you know, we can handle multiple rate hikes. Uh, you know, one question for us is though it has to make a dent in inflation or we're gonna have other problems. Uh, you know, we have to watch the hard economic data. I think the Fed's doing the same thing. They've said they're data dependent. Can the economic data hold up during all of these rate hikes. I think initially we're seeing signs that it can because the stagflation is a period where um, we have low employment and lower economic growth. And we're just not really seeing that yet. We still have a very strong economy here. And so, you know, we are not initially worried about these rate hikes, as I said earlier. We want to be careful about leaving too money on the table in the early cycles of rate hikes and just because the yield curve is inverting in, in certain places. Sarah, you said the word that keeps me up at night, stagflation, because what I worry about is that if if the inflation is coming from external sources like the war in Ukraine and the lack of fertilizer, the lack of wheat, higher prices to wages because people are demanding it before they go back to work. That makes me worry that that economic growth is going to get squashed in this summer. The Fed can't fight that kind of inflation with just higher rates. And we end up, as you said, in stagflation. I know for my portfolio, that, that's the worst situation of all. There, there's almost nothing we can find to invest in to make us money in, in a stagflation environment. If you actually look at the 70s uh, during the period of stagflation, uh, you know, during the early period, it was a very challenging period to invest. But later on, actually, that was when equities and real assets actually performed pretty well. So you, know, you can find period during that cycle, you can actually have times where you can make good returns on your investments. Um, so, I mean, I agree it, it's a concern out there, but it's not something that we're worried about right now. Also, within inflation, you know, I think the Fed's seeing the same thing where there's noise in those numbers from uh, tighter supply chains to the war that we're seeing. These things are not necessary things that are going to remain permanently. So what is that true baseline inflation number when we're through this? That's what you know we're not clear on. I don't think the Fed is yet. And they have the ability to pull back on rate increases um, once we start to see what inflation really looks like when we're past some of these unusual uh, occurrences that are happening. Uh, Chris, to wrap up this investment cycle, let's talk about something you referred to earlier, and that is the energy transition. Uh, what effect, if any, will the war in Ukraine have on that? Because we saw just this week, for example, the United States now commit to a huge new supply of LNG, liquid natural gas, to, to Europe. What's going to happen in the energy transition in this world? David, it's brought it to light that it's not going to be smooth, that it is going to be a difficult transition. I get a ton of pressure from teachers that want us to dump U.S. oil companies. And now maybe they realize that, well, we don't want to be dependent on Russia and Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. It needs to be a transition where consumers change, utilities change. You know, the number one thing is how we generate electricity first and foremost. So we've got to find ways to have a thoughtful transition 
and we don't want to be ge geopolitically linked to one economy or one type of fuel. We want to be diversified. And so, you know, we've, we've got time of 20 years, but it has to start now and it has to be meaningful. I, I can't emphasize enough. We've got to start the transition and we've got to get rid of the politics and the fight and have honest discussions. It's not going to be smooth and it's not going to be cheap. I'm in my father-in-law's office and I remember last time I was here was almost back in the 70s, Sarah, and there were odd and even gas lines. Yeah. People are panicking right now about $6 a gallon gas. It's going to have to go a lot higher for us to have this transition. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember those odd and even gas lines, actually. Sarah, just to wrap this up quickly, are there investment opportunities in that more complicated energy transition? I agree with Chris on focusing on the transition. For example, some of these large energy companies are the bridge to the future of, of better climate impact. Like look at Valero, they are working on renewable green diesel. So these companies are, are helping to get us to the next phase and we wanna you know, work with them and partner with them um, because it is making sure that we're thoughtful about how we transition to a, you know, a better climate uh, is, is the key here. But, but Chris, is it gonna take longer than we thought? It can't because we're going to fry the planet. The more we delay, the worse the problem gets. Is it going to take a long time? Yeah, it's going to take 20 years, David. But the more the governments procrastinate, the worse it gets. Human beings are terrible at paying attention to long-term risks. We know things are bad for us, yet we still go and do it. We pay attention to short-term risks. So maybe when uh, Battery Park and the bottom of New York keeps flooding, maybe, maybe then they'll pay attention. But we've got to do the change and start it now. Do you agree, Sarah? I mean, I think that we need to be thoughtful about it and be on top of it. And as right. I mentioned, some of these larger companies might be the key to helping right. solve it. Thank you so very much to both of you. That's Sarah Malik of Nuveen and Chris Elman of Calsters. Great to have you both with us. Coming up, we're going to take a look at what's happening next week on Global Wall Street. Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. It's time to take a look at what's coming up next week on Global Wall Street, starting with Juliet Sally in Singapore. Thanks, David. The focus in Asia this week will be a virtual summit between China and the EU. Even before the Ukraine war, Beijing was seeking closer ties with the bloc to counter frayed relations with Washington. Chinese banks are another watch with earnings due. We could see a boost to lending revenue thanks to an aggressive growth target from officials. Meanwhile, the Australian government is due to hand down its annual budget Tuesday with a national election just weeks away and Prime Minister Scott Morrison trailing badly in the polls. Now over to Laura Reich in London. London. Laura? Thanks, Julia. Well, following up on what you were saying, that all-important virtual summit between China and the European Union, the primary goal is to diffuse tensions between the two sides, which have widened since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Participants include China's President Xi Jinping, China's Premier Li Keqiang, European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen and European Council President Charles Michel. The European Union is expected to warn China of severe consequences if Beijing tries to mitigate the impact of any sanctions against the Kremlin. Thank you, Laura. Of course, here in the U.S., a really big week. We're going to start Tuesday. We're going to get the conference board consumer sentiment, a key gauge here on the consumers. We push forward to the big event of the week, which, of course, is Jobs Day. Economists looking for a slight deceleration, about 480,000 jobs, but a dropping unemployment rate again to about a 3.7 percent. This comes again as all eyes on the Federal Reserve markets now pricing in 200 basis points of additional rate hikes as we really look for a Federal Reserve to act on the heels of that jobs report. I'm Taylor Riggs in New York. David, back to you. Coming up, the SEC wants companies to disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. But what are they already doing to get to net zero? Bank of America has done the survey, and its head of research, Candace Browning, is here with the report. That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Getting to zero, that's the goal that countries representing 88% of greenhouse emissions and 90% of GDP have set for themselves, making progress all but inevitable. That's according to President Biden's climate envoy, John Kerry. 
No president in the future would walk into the White House and undo what is going on around the world. This is bigger than the United States, what is this response. People all around the world are retooling. And corporations are quickly signing up to do their part, like BP's CEO, Bernard Looney. We will reinvest two pounds, more than that actually, for every pound that we make. And the majority of that investment, the vast majority of it, will go into helping Britain transition to a net zero future. This week, the SEC gave corporations a nudge, proposing new requirements that publicly traded companies disclose their greenhouse gas emissions. So now, it appears there's no turning back. Before we can go forward into a zero emissions world, we have to know where we are right now and particularly where companies are in really being committed to zero emissions. To find that out, Bank of America has done a comprehensive survey of 3,400 different companies around the world. And here to tell us about what she found out, we welcome Candace Browning. She is head of global research for Bank of America. So Candace, thanks so much for being here. What did you learn from your survey? Oh, David, we learned so many things. I mean, the first thing we learned is that this really is a movement. I mean, I was surprised, you know. In 2019, about 16 percent of the world's GDP, you know, by country, had committed to some sort of net zero plan. And today, just three years later, that number is 90 percent. And, you know, this whole thing was really led initially by policymakers, right? But now what's happened is all these other groups have jumped in, whether it's activist shareholders or, you know, whether it's consumers who want to buy, you know, goods that they think are not, don't have a huge carbon footprint. Um, so it's all, it's, it's shareholders, they've all jumped in and everybody wants to get on this wagon. So the first big takeaway was that, it, you know, it's, it's a movement and it's going to happen. And I think actually that the events between Russia and Ukraine are actually going to further accelerate this because Europe, you know, has to get off its dependency on hydrocarbons. So the first big takeaway was that, it, that it's really a movement and it's happening. So, so, Candace, they need to get off their dependence. You say Ukraine drives that home powerfully. How difficult is it going to be? Because one of the things I really focused on in reading your survey was there are three different categories here of emissions. And one of them is your own companies. Another is the people who supply you. But then there's a third category that actually dwarfs the other two. Yeah, basically the first one is what you use to make your goods and, and services and products. And then the second one is the, the purchased energy, you know, the electricity that you buy. And then the third one is the really difficult one to, um, to measure, and that is really the carbon footprint of all of your suppliers. And it's estimated that that third level, David, is three times as big as level one and level two. So that is kind of, I kind of think of it as being an iceberg. So you're a corporation and you say, I'm going to get to net zero, you control level one and level two. But controlling level three, all of your suppliers, that is really complicated, but we have to do that if we're going to get to net zero as a society. You know, how people get there, David, they're basically three different strategies. You know, there's mitigation, and then there's transformation, and then there's financial engineering. So those are sort of the three ways that you can get to net zero if you're a corporation. In doing your survey, did you get a sense of timeline for these corporations? If they're committed to net zero, how long is it going to take? Yes, we did, and it was fascinating. So what we found is that of the 3,400 companies, that 11% of them globally said they're going to get there by 2030. That's just eight years away. That number quadruples by the time 2040, 41% of the companies said that they would be there. And there are also some real differences by region. So if you look at Europe, for example, there, 20 percent of companies say they're going to get there by 2030. So they're far ahead of the rest of the world. In China, fully a third of companies don't even have a timeline. So there are big differences by region. Well, talk about that geographic dispersion, if I can call it that. You talked about Europe. Uh, you talked about China. Where is the United States? You know, the United States is just solidly right, um, right in the middle there. Uh, I think it's about, I can't remember the exact number for 2030, but we're solidly in the middle, and we've been accelerating uh, our timeline. 
Uh, okay, we have at Wall Street Week, we appeal to investors, try to inform them. What's this going to cost? What's this going to do to revenue, uh, the top line on the one hand? What's also going to do to the cost line? Well, that was the really fascinating part of the study. So what we found is that in general, the 3,400 companies, analysts expected that revenues would decline about 5%. Now, that averaged from 0% to as much as 14%, um, depending on the sector. Uh, for example, energy companies, you would imagine, would have one of the biggest hits. So we think that there'll be a revenue hit. Interestingly, we also think that there's going to be a real pickup in research costs. So about $1.2 trillion of R&D will be spent, we think, over the next five years. And capital expenditures we think will be about $2.4 trillion over the next five years. So put it together. You've got lower revenues. You've got higher costs. It means that you're going to have a hit to operating profits, which we think will be down about 5% on average. So that sounds like a pretty grim picture. And, you know, in the short term, there definitely will be pain. But there are going to be companies that are going to be beneficiaries of this as well. Okay, name a couple. <laughs> I'm going to name a couple of areas, David, where I think you're going to see real beneficiaries. Um, one is going to be the enablers, right, like the people who produce renewables or the industrials that produce, um, you know, products that contribute to better energy efficiency. I think you'll see financials uh, benefit because we're, they're going to, you know, with this lower revenue and higher costs, you're going to see companies need to, uh, to raise money. So they would uh, be beneficiaries as well. And then I think you're going to see beneficiaries in terms of the first movers. You know, the first movers who are able to, do, to get to net zero, it's going to be helpful to their brand. They're going to lock in lower capital costs. Um, and they're going to, you know, avoid some of the vagrants, some of the variations in the pricing of hydrocarbons. So there are going to be companies that are going to benefit here, the enablers, the first movers, the financials. Ken, as you, are, as I say, are in charge of research for Bank of America, so you like data, like, like numbers, what the yeah. numbers are. How are we going to know whether these companies are delivering on their promises? We had this week the SEC come out and propose a new rule about disclosure on greenhouse gases. Do we need to get to a standardized world where we're all reporting and maybe required, we're required to report so we know if these companies are actually delivering on their promises? I think that is a great question and I think the answer is very clearly yes. We need to have some sort of standards just like we have standards you know general accounting principles we agree they're a little bit different country by country but in general we have standards. We need the same kind of standards to measure all of these ESG metrics and I think that the move that the SEC made this last week is really a very good first step in that regard and it applies really to um, level one and level two emissions that we were talking about before where it's going to get really tricky is finding those metrics and that framework for how you measure the level three uh, emissions but I was uh, very pleased to see that the SEC came out and did what they did this week. Uh, so finally Candace, give us a sense of why you did the study to begin with. Uh, Bank of America does a lot of great work but you're doing it because it's part of your business. Why was this important for Bank of America? You know, it was important for Bank of America because one of the things that we want to do is look at transformation and really provide original anticipatory ideas to investor clients. And this really was, um, I wanted to anticipate how net zero was going to be implemented. And I learned a lot, and so did all of the analysts learn a lot, um, you know, talking to all their companies and really understanding this transformation. This is huge. This is potentially as big as the Industrial Revolution. It's going to take a long time to happen. But, you know, 2030 and 2040 aren't that far away if you're investing. So that's why we did it. Well, it's a fascinating study. As I say, I learned a lot from it. I really thank you for sharing it with us here on Wall Street Week. That is Candace Browning. She is head of global research for Bank of America. Coming up, we wrap up the week with special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We welcome back now our special contributor here at Wall Street Week, Larry Summers. And Larry, you were at least perhaps a little bit in the news this week for one specific reason. We heard from Fed Chair Jay Powell at the NABE meetings down in Washington, and he went out of his way to sort of uh, correct the record on exactly how aggressive the Fed will be. Some people have said he was responding to some of your criticisms of what he said last week, where clearly the bond markets didn't listen to him. You know, I don't. I don't know whether I had anything to do with it uh, at all. I think he did signal more hawkishness, and I think that was very much warranted given the inflation threat. I do think there are a number of problems in Fed thought where they're advocating and making arguments that I don't think really stand up to economic scrutiny. So let's take, uh, let's go through some of those arguments. One of the things I think I heard from the chair was uh, actually inflation is going to get relieved because there will be an expansion in the labor force. It'll relieve some of the wage pressure that you've talked about. You know, an expansion in the labor force matters if it changes the supply demand balance in an important way. But if the people all work, then it translates into more demand offsetting the increase in supply. And the Fed's not forecasting any increase in unemployment. So with no forecast and increase in unemployment, I don't know why one would think that an expanded labor force would somehow be a reason why inflation would come down. It would only exert restraint on wages if it translated into higher unemployment, something the Fed is at pains to predict will not take place. Uh, so the second thing that we heard from the chair today, uh, this week was, uh, in fact, that they are willing to go up to the neutral rate and above the neutral rate in the Fed funds in order to get inflation under control. Is that going to do it? I think we have to be careful with that. Uh, in a sense, I think the Fed is doing a summa can opener economics. Uh, after the old joke about the economist when asked how to, how to get into a tuna fish can, uh, says, assume we have a can opener. The reality is that the neutral interest rate is a real interest rate concept. It reflects the difference between the interest rate and inflation. What the Fed's doing is assuming their own success with respect to inflation, that it comes down to about 2 percent, and then saying that their interest rate forecast will represent a positive real interest rate and will correspond to their neutral interest rate. But it all depends on assuming their success. Markets are saying that real interest rates aren't getting anywhere near the Fed's estimate of the neutral real interest rate any time in the next uh, five years. And certainly that's what most professional forecasters are saying in terms of uh, their views about uh, inflation. So I don't think we're seeing the kind of increase in, infl in interest rates that's usually necessary to go for uh, inflation. I don't agree with uh, Republican economist John Taylor on that many things. But his Taylor principle that to stop inflation, you have to raise interest rates by more than inflation goes up, because otherwise the real interest rate is coming down. That's a valid principle, but not one that's yet been internalized in the Fed's forecasts. Uh, um, third thing that we heard from the chair this week was he admitted, I think, that it's going to be difficult to have a soft landing. He nonetheless is confident it can be done, in part because it's been done before. There are at least three other instances people are pointing to, right? 94, 84, 69. I don't see how anybody can regard those as very relevant uh, precedents. In none of them was the CPI at anything like 8 percent when the episode started. In none of them was the unemployment rate or the vacancy to unemployment rate in historically tight labor market territory. And in all of them, the whole point by the Fed was preemptive action to restrain. And that's what this Fed ruled out in its 2020 operating framework. So look, many things are possible, and I share very much the chairman's hope that a soft landing is possible, but I don't think it's something we can count on. So, Larry, are you confident that we know what it will take to get inflation down at this point? Or, more important, does the Fed know? 
Look, nobody knows. I certainly don't. I don't think the Fed knows. I do think uh, that it's likely to require significantly greater interest rate hikes than the Fed or markets are now accept expecting. And I do think that we need clear signals that we're prepared to accept some slowdown in economic activity if that's the price of reducing inflation. Otherwise, we're going to be making the mistakes of the 1970s that will ultimately create a need for a really catastrophic recession. I think that can be avoided, but it can't be avoided if we're counting on some kind of immaculate reversion of inflation or immaculate disinflation. Larry, as we speak, that horrific war in Ukraine continues. And of course, we're all fixated on the death and destruction. But there are also economic consequences. What do you see as potential longer range global economic consequences of what we're seeing? I fear, and it's too early to know, and we may never, we'll never get the data to do a really accurate measurement. But my fear is that there's going to be more death thousands of miles from Ukraine because of the food price hikes, food shortages, and potential famines that are associated with uh, the loss of crop in Ukraine and Russia, that that will ultimately be the cause of more death than what happens uh, in uh, Ukraine. That, of course, is not to minimize the tragedy in Ukraine. But it is to point up uh, the need for the world community to be focusing, even on it, as it focuses on Ukraine, to be focusing on the needs of developing countries broadly, the need for financing, the need for debt relief, the need for uh, food uh, allocations. I think this is a critical issue, and it could become a more critical issue depending on developments in the next few weeks. We've had some people this week uh, predict perhaps we're seeing the end of globalization. Larry Fink, for example, from BlackRock said that uh, in the media. What do you think about that uh, as a possibility at this point? We're certainly seeing the evolution of hyperglobalization. We're going to see more, rely more emphasis on just in time case rather than just in time. But I don't think we're going to see anything like the end of globalization. I think as long as there are smartphones, as long as there are video cameras, as long as there is uh, Zoom, we are going to see levels of interaction between countries that are greater than anything that was taking place uh, even 20 years ago. So. I think discussions of the demise of globalization are overheated. And I think they're even a little bit dangerous because they risk a self-fulfilling prophecy. Finally, Larry, uh, we lost a true pioneer this week in Madeleine Albright, a scholar, a diplomat, the first woman secretary of state. And I believe when she was appointed that position, it was the most senior position ever served by a, a woman in the United States. I know you served with her. Give us your thoughts about Madeleine Albright, what she did, what her legacy is. Madeleine was a special uh, person. She was a role model for uh, so many uh, women. She ascended to the highest levels of power while always maintaining the highest level of decency, humanity, collegiality, kindness, uh, to others. She showed uh, that you could be tough and generous at the same time. It was a privilege to serve with her. I learned a great deal uh, from her. And her practical but moral impulse about the conduct of America's foreign policy will be very much missed. And I hope it will live on in those who've learned the lessons of her spectacular career. Larry, thank you very much for sharing that with us. That's Larry Summers of Harvard, our very special contributor here on Wall Street Week. Coming up, the combat of politics, literally. Is it worse or has it always been thus? That's next on Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
finally, one more thought. They say that war is politics by other means, but what happens when politics starts to look like war? American politics has always had a bit of an edge to it, going all the way back to 1980, when a moderator in a primary debate in New Hampshire wanted to turn off Ronald Reagan's mic. I am paying for this microphone, Mr. And it got physical at a news conference in Baghdad in 2008 when someone in the audience threw a shoe at President George W. Bush. So what if the guy threw a shoe at me? And of course, there was the famous confrontation between candidate Joe Biden and the woman who was to become his vice president in the 2020 primary debate. So that's where the federal government must step in. That's why we have the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. That's why we need to pass the Equality Act. That's why we need to pass the ERA, because that there are moments in history where states fail to preserve the civil rights of all people. Support. But we saw a political confrontation taken to a whole new level in the debate between two Republican candidates trying to win the nomination for the Senate in Ohio, Josh Mandel and Mike Gibbons, when they came about as close to fisticuffs as you can get on a stage on live TV. You watch what happens. You watch what happens. But then again, maybe they're following a more ancient tradition, one going all the way back to 1856 when Congressman Preston Brooks of South Carolina went on the floor of the U.S. Senate and took his cane to Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts, nearly killing him right in the middle of a speech, admittedly a somewhat lurid speech, against slavery. And although we may have come to expect somewhat better of our senators these days, there's still always room in the government of Turkey or Mexico or Taiwan for a good old-fashioned brawl. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.